Facebook Live. This will be shared on the SD at home page. And like with the recording, it will also be paused. Um, Uh, when it comes time for audience questions. I'm seeing that we're in a practice uh, session. Are we starting soon? Yes. Oh, wait, do you and want me to share some music? I can. All right, okay. starting now. Start. All right, people are starting to roll in. Oh, wait, I don't think it's working. <laughs> oh, good, that's way plans on that. Um, welcome everyone, we will get started in about three minutes. We're letting people roll in and make sure that they get their uh, sound and um, computer set up. We also have a Q&A function if you want to ask your questions ahead of time, and feel free to also use the chat. Thank you so much for joining us. We will get started in a few minutes. Also, feel free to shout out in the chat where you are streaming from. Oh, Dallas, Texas. Nice. I'm a Southern girl, so I like seeing Dallas. <laughs> oh, we have someone from San Jose and Fremont. I grew up in Fremont. Beanie in West Oakland. Nice. Union City. Oakland. Oh, town. All right, in just one more minute, we will get started. And yes, happy Affordable Housing Month, everyone. All right, sounds like we shall get started. So, Welcome everyone. Uh, if you uh, would like, uh, we have live captioning for this uh, event. Um, so if you would like to turn on or turn off caption, just click on the more button and then uh, show or hide subtitles is your option. Um, so we want to keep this as accessible as we can. Um, the next thing is um, welcome to our event. Um, this is hosted by Coalition of Housers or COHO. The Coalition of Housers is a network of new and emerging leaders working in and advocating for affordable housing in the South Bay. As the need for affordable housing grows, so does the need for supporting the leadership and professional development of a diverse community of practitioners in the affordable housing industry and among industry partners. So we're so happy for you to join us today for a really, really great panel. We're quite excited. I'm going to introduce also um, my fellow COHO working group members, uh, Stephen Yang, Macy Long, Young, and I might be messing that up. I'm so sorry, Macy. Tiffany Wong and Max Pommier. Um, and I will turn it over to them to introduce our guests. Thank you, Emily. Um, Hi everyone, it's so great to be here and we're very excited and happy Affordable Housing Month as well. Um, thank you for joining us today, um, as Emily said, at SF Home Co-host Workplace Diversity Panel. And thank you to Emily and our Coho fellows for hosting this event um, during Affordable Housing Month. 
So I want to also thank the audience who's taking some time to participate in today's dialogue and our panelists who's going to share their wonderful experience and perspectives. I'm looking forward very much so with a rich and insightful conversation. Um, my name is Macy Leung and I'm a senior project manager at Allied Housing Abode Services, uh, focusing on developing permanent supportive housing in the Bay Area. I've had the pleasure today to co-moderate the panel with Stephen Yang from Housing Trust of Silicon Valley, who will introduce himself in a few minutes. Um, I'd like to start by framing this important discussion today and centering on inclusivity and wanting to work together to examine some of the best practices and solutions on how we can elevate and celebrate an inclusive and diverse workforce that really reflects the diverse community stakeholders and residents who we serve, especially in affordable housing. Um, I also want to recognize that we are a workforce of, with four generations, we we're just talking about that earlier, um, with workers who are digitally savvy and those who are digitally comfortable, especially in this virtual world, especially in this past couple of years. So I hope that our discussion will explore the strength and some of the challenges within the context of diversity and also within the context of an intergeneration workforce and how we can collectively continue to really adapt and sustain market and industry changes in the future and centering around diversity and inclusivity in the workplace. So with that, I'm really much looking forward to today's discussion and hearing from our panelists and our audience. And I'm gonna turn this over to our panelists right now to do a self-introduction. Then I'll turn it over to my colleague, Steven, to introduce himself and kick off the meeting. So we'll start with Lillian. Thanks, Macy. Hi, I'm uh, really happy to be here with all of you today. My name is Lily Lou Haler. I go by she and her pronouns, and I'm currently with Mercy Housing, where I recently became the um, VP of Operations after many years at Mid Penn Housing, where I worked in real estate development, and that's primarily what I've been doing for the last 20 years. Um, I became an affordable houser or a houser as I refer to myself because uh, I really want to live in diverse and inclusive communities. And so I think I got to be part of making them if that's what I want. Um, and, and in part, that's because I uh, come from a mixed race family. I'm queer and I'm a young Gen Xer. So those are sort of the, the, the pieces of my um, uh, identity that I'll, I'll bring to the conversation today. And, and I appreciate Macy highlighting the generational one because it's been, it's been prominent for me recently. Um, and I'll hand it over to Illy. Hello, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm so happy to be um, on this panel today with such amazing people. So I want to start by saying that. Uh, my name is Ilyasha Pete. My friends and enemies call me Illy. I am from the South. I grew up playing tennis in a time where people didn't look like me playing tennis. I am the daughter of civil rights activists who were part of Martin Luther King's very last speech. I have been taught from a very early age to kick down doors, open them, hold, like open them and hold them open as I try to propel or make space for people to propel themselves forward. I am a believer um, as an individual and as a person that works within organizations. And I do consulting for organizations that we have to embrace and celebrate the differences of all the people and the stories that come to the table. And I'm really looking forward to having rich discussion centering around that. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Lillian and Illy, uh, you know, for your self introductions. Uh, so I'm Stephen Yang, my pronouns are he, him, and I uh, work for Housing Trust Silicon Valley, Director of Multifamily Lending and our Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Lead. I had Housing Trust for a Community Development Financial in Institution uh, in the affordable housing space, and we service the greater 13 Bay Area counties. And it's uh, an honor and a privilege to be in conversation uh, with our panelists today and later on in this session uh, to be in conversation with you, the audience. Uh, so very much looking forward to that. Now, uh, before I kick us off, I think, um, you know, we would be remiss if we do not uh, mention the Buffalo massacre that occurred 
uh, this past weekend, you know, this racist attack against black people, uh, where 13 people were um, shot at and 10 of them killed. Um, and the gunman, you know, wrote a 180 page manifesto avowing white supremacist beliefs and, you know, and all the hateful texts and everything like that. And really, this manifesto seems to intend to confer, you know, a sense of intellectual sophistication to what really is a savage act. And I think uh, that's why it's so important that we hold space such as these to uh, gather in community to where we're able to discuss openly and explicitly that, hey, racism, prejudices, stereotypes, they do, they exist, and that words do matter. And, you know, we can either propagate hate and evil that results in devastation and ruin, or we can educate ourselves and refuse to be bystanders and find concrete ways to take action to uh, be anti-racist. So it's with this unfortunate tragic backdrop that we hold this next hour in conversation uh, to be in community, acknowledge that there's much more to do to advance equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging. And uh, you know, to highlight that generally as a societal benefit, but zooming in within our affordable housing ecosystem and respective organizations. Um, you know, it really, we formatted this conversation where there will be a call to action and practical examples. And we hope, uh, you know, again, to advance uh, advances anti-racist. And with that, I'll turn it back to Macy. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you for your acknowledgement and your words. Um, so to kick us off, we are framing um, our first few questions on getting a shared understanding of diversity and inclusion and what that means to you guys individually and in your organization and the work that you do. So to level set where we are, um, the question, first question is for both panelists. Um, what does diversity and inclusion means to you and why, why are they important to you personally and in the work that you do? So um, we'll start off with uh, Lillian and affordable housing and then Illy to bring us from a broader perspective. Thanks, Macy. Um, I, I wanted to take just a moment to reflect on um, having this space to talk about diversity and inclusion during affordable housing month, which is really exciting and great. Um, as someone who I think remembers probably affordable housing, when affordable housing month was affordable housing week and, and when it started um, and with just a few events and mostly um, you know, uh, at properties and it's really expanded and it's great to have this space in the month. So thank you to COHO for um, bringing diversity and inclusion into the discussion of affordable housing in, in as many ways as we can. Um, as I mentioned, I, I've made a uh, change recently from organization to organization, and I think every organization kind of um, hopefully does the work to come together around definitions of diversity and inclusion and what that means in their workplace. And in changing workplaces, I've kind of had to think about what does it mean for, for me so that I can carry that with myself always. And I, I really think of diversity as who's here, who, who's in the room, how different are we from each other? I think of inclusion as how comfortable are the folks who are here? Um, and then I think of equity as are the folks who are here getting the support they need to be successful, right? Because that doesn't look the same for everyone. So on a very just personal practical level, that's how I think about um, diversity and inclusion. Um, and, and I think for me, uh, you know, as someone who has uh, family members who really don't look like each other and comes from a mixed background, um, it almost feels like diversity and inclusion is genetic for me, right? It's really important that we make space for um, different people to come together because sometimes they have families. Um, and, uh, and, and also because those are the types of, of places where I want to live and work. Um, I think they are more interesting and they are more fun they um, are more challenging sometimes, um, but it's really the type of, of environment that I want to spend time in. Um, it's true for our communities and it's true for our workplaces. So 
And um, that's been really important for me to kind of assess as I look at different work, as I as I look at different workplaces, um, also as I look at my own workplace and think about how I can foster that. Um, I think if we want those dynamic workplaces that come up with new solutions, where people actually want to come and work, want to come together to work, to be collaborative, they have to be uh, diverse and inclusive. And so really figuring out how do we both as organizations and as individuals contribute to making those environments is, um, is really important. Um, the last piece I would add, just particular to affordable housing, I think it's important for affordable housing organizations and the industry to um, work towards reflecting the communities that we serve if we truly want to serve our resident, if we want to have a user centered, a, a resident focused um, experience and success, then we have to um, be in community with those folks and our, our industry has to be able to um, reflect that and um, represent that and tap into that. So I, I'll, maybe I'll leave it there and turn it over to Ellie. Okay, I'm gonna take a little bit of a different approach, but I am gonna say, I totally agree with you. It's important too, that people be able to live where they work. And so many times you see people having to travel miles and miles and miles. And in California, just a few miles can take a long time. So um, totally agree with you on that. I really like an interactive style. So I'm gonna ask a question. I hope that you all answer in the chat. My question to you is, I know many of you have probably heard with all the stuff that's gone over the last couple of years, the, what DEI is. Have any of you heard of the term IDEAL, I-D-E-A-L? If you have, put yes in the chat. I'm going to give you a second to, to, to add that yes. And if you have it, you can always put no. Now, keep in mind, this question was not rhetorical. Anyway... <laughs> So, no, okay, seeing some no's now. I haven't heard of this. All right, well, I'm gonna drop in the chat the Cliff Notes version of what ideal means and then kind of tell you, share with you what that means to me. It's inclusion, diversity, equity, access, and liberation. And my thought is that you can't have DEI without the access and the liberation. And that, that really speaks very much to the housing. So I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna tell you the, the definitions that lead and guide not only my professional life, but my personal life with these, with these uh, principles. Inclusion, I see it as a universal right. It's kind of, it can be considered a business strategy where you get the richness of ideas and backgrounds and perspectives and they're all harnessed. It's where we create space for a person to be valued, respected, honored, and supported. And they have the same advantages as people that are historically, who, who aren't historically excluded. Diversity, I see it's the presence of people in all the different ways we identify, the ones that are common, but also those that aren't as common, people that are mentally and physically um, challenged, or they have a different type of ability, uh, gender, sexual orientation, employment status, education levels, race, gender, all those things uh, are considered. Equity. Many people talk, think equity and equality are the same, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how I think they're different. It's a process that begins when you acknowledge that there's an unequal starting place. And we have to address that imbalance to make sure that people are receiving the same unique opportunities. We have to eliminate barriers in order to do that. Equity ensures that people are able to grow, contribute, thrive, develop, regardless as to who they are, what age they are, what sexual orientation they are, and so on and so forth. Access, I see, and it's one that's, that, that I see as new, but so very important. It's the equitable right of engagement. Um, it's giving you the opportunity regardless of your human ability. In addition to physical or virtual accessibility, it can be applied to information or decision-making capabilities uh, for a particular person or group. Finally, one of my favorites is liberation. 
I see it as the enjoyment of equal rights and full social and economic realization for a particular group. It's the protection from abuse or exploitation. It is freedom from oppression. It really makes space for people to be who they are. And I think as a leader, I was, uh, I'm a consultant with Center for Excellence and Nonprofits and have worked with many organizations. And as a leader, when we can lean into the ideal principles, we can champion the people that we work with and celebrate what they're bringing to the table that, that we don't have. Thank you both Lillian and Illy. Um, that was a very illuminating and rich introduction. I can relate to Lily's mixed race family and my own family and think about how that um, translates to the community that we live in. It's also funny when we talk about culture within my own family so I can relate to your story. And also Illy for the really illuminating perspective, especially with access and how we can equalize opportunities. Um, so thank you for kicking us off with both of these. Uh, with that, I wanted to ask each of you guys um, individual questions. Um, so for Lillian, um, and you talk a little bit about this, but maybe you can expand on a bit more detail. Um, having been in the affordable housing industry and continue to uh, work in it, how do you center specifically inclusivity as an integral part of your workplace culture and success? Yeah, um, Ellie, I hope you have not trademarked ideal. I love it. I'm going to adopt it. <laughs> um, I'm going to adopt it as I think about, you know, how do I how do I center inclusion in my workplace? Um, I uh, I think that there are often multiple efforts and um, initiatives that are happening within workplaces, hopefully to make them inclusive. I want to acknowledge that a lot of the organizations in the affordable housing community are doing um, formal DEI work, ready work, ideal work. Um, and I think that that is really important to, to bring about organizational change and large scale cultural change. Um, and I think what we can do, and I think about this for myself personally, what I do as an individual is also incredibly important, particularly if um, folks are in a position of managers or supervisors, leaders, um, allies, that, that it, it is really important to um, champion. And I love that Illy used that word. It's one that I um, come back to time and time again, that we, that we champion and we lift up the work of others and really create space for folks to shine who don't always get a chance to or haven't traditionally um, had a chance to, whether that's um, because of their age or their race or their gender, for, for whatever reason, we know that um, not everybody has equal access to decision-making or to, um, promotion and opportunity. And so I think it's really important for us to all think about when we champion um, each other's work and we lift each other's up. And, and I think about that in terms of like, do I give credit where credit is due? Am I making sure that people are credited and recognized for their work? Am I bringing folks to meetings? Am I you know, providing that seat at the table? Um, I will not come up with the exact Shirley Chisholm quote, but to, you know, bring your own seat. Well, sometimes it's hard to bring our own seats to the table, right? Like, let's bring one for someone else. If you're already at that table, make room. Um, and then, and thinking about how we, we mentor. Um, so, so those are ways where I think it's, it's really important to, to clearly signal to folks that they are welcome and that you are working hard to include them. Um, as I, age in the workplace, as I get older, I'm not um, the youngest generation, but I think like two generations now, I found that it's incredibly important to, to also listen to my younger colleagues. And I have learned an incredible amount from them, especially, um, you know, as we emerge out of COVID. Uh, so, so I think listening is really important. Um, being a place where folks can come for 
advice and know that that you're a safe person to talk to is 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 an individual contribution to making your workplace more inclusive right do folks have someone that they can come and talk to if um, there is a microaggression or if they are trying to figure out how to do more work or advance in the workplace do they have um, do they have mentorship and and support so i think that's really important and then um, I, I think one other piece that I think about in terms of just my individual ability to make make the workplace more inclusive, which you know hopefully layers on with that organizational um, level as well, is um, when am I courageous? And sometimes I think it's it's easier to be courageous on behalf of other folks, right? So sometimes when I'm thinking, gosh, I really um, I really want that to look differently. And maybe I want it to look differently for myself, but I really want it to look differently, um, you know, for the folks I know who don't feel as included or haven't had opportunity to sit in some of the meetings that I have. Um, I really try to think about uh, bettering the workplace and having that courage to to make change, to push back, to ask for more um, on behalf of. Um, of my colleagues and uh, the next generation of of housing leaders. So I I um I guess I would speak to that just individually of, of I think a lot of what how can I do this on a day to day basis in small ways that support the organizational work that we're doing as well. Can I lean in here, Lillian? I love Come on in, Ellie. Love lean the question, on. right? Love the question about um, or, or love the the courageous. Um, what you talked about there and that to people that have been historically excluded is some, one of the best gifts that you can give sometimes as a, not an ally, but a co-conspirator mm -hmm. because we are faced with fighting the battle every day, all day. And when someone leans in for me, I see it as a blessing. So I, I do appreciate that and I honor that. And it was very interesting to me. And the question that I posed in the chat was, how are, how are our audience members being courageous? We'd love to hear about that as well. Thank you, Lillian. And thank you, Illy, for that. Um, I love the ideas of both the mentorship, bring your seat at the table and Emily put in the chat, if not bring a folding chair if there are no seats. And then also reciprocally being courageous as, as well. So with that, I'm gonna ask Emily a question is, um, with your perspective, um, spanning across Center for Excellence and Nonprofit, California Life Science, and now as consultant, what have you seen and what has it been the most helpful for you when thinking about workplace process of recruiting, hiring, day-to-day -day culture, promotion, echoing what Lillian had started alluding to and talking about? So what I've seen is that it's very similar to, simple, similar to board development. They talk about, we need diversity, but they're not willing to make any changes to have it. What we have to realize is that as you bring in new people, they're not gonna fit into the old culture because they weren't part of it. They weren't thought about when it was created. There has to be a new culture created with everybody doing their part to help us do the shift. When you're trying to hire, if you give a nod by saying, we, we, we give added pay for a second language, that invites people in differently. So I suggest that people go and they start looking at, at their job descriptions. Are you being inclusive in those descriptions? Are you opening doors? Are you saying that lived experience is just as good as education or in we have to understand that people's talents come in different ways in different places and until we open the doors to get that information in and and bring people in that are thinking differently than we do we're not going to be we're not going to have an ideal workplace the other thing that I'll say that's interesting, it's going to kind of take this question a little bit to the right a little bit, um, but bear with me. So many organizations say that they're ready, but they're not. Or they're ready at one level and not another. Change has to be 
a commitment by each person, each part of the team to facilitate it. We are not all at the same spots in our journey. We are all gonna learn. We're all gonna make mistakes. That's okay. We have to be willing to forgive, understand, make space for those mistakes so we can all grow together. Uh, we have to honor and authentically accept apologies, learn from them, and then continue on our journey. At, at CEN, I've taken this phrase from them wherever I've gone. We believe once you've seen one org or one company, you've seen one company. This journey is different for each organization. And if you're bringing in someone to help, they need to understand that. Thank you very much. I'll turn this over to Stephen. Can I just jump in for a second? Because I love this emphasis on change, Illy, and like, and how much change we are really, I am really asking the, the affordable housing industry and our country to make, I think. Um, and it, it strikes me that right now we are all undergoing a lot of change, not necessarily by choice because of COVID and the pandemic and um, you know, hybrid work schedules and remote work. And so it's also to me an opportunity for all of us to push for change in our organizations. We're already doing it. Everybody knows they've got to change. So um, to think about, as we think about like remote work or hybrid schedules, how do we push that to be as inclusive as possible? How do we push that to really allow us to diversify our workforces and, um, and really sort of seize this opportunity that we have? Thanks for that, uh, Lillian and Illy. Um, you know, you're, you, you both mentioned change. Um, and Illy, you talked about, you know, hiring best practices, you know, uh, things, how we can go about recruitment, um, all of that. I think you and I talked about the COVID shuffle, right? That's your turn that I'm going to steal and share with everyone here. Illy, you're talking about change, changing remote work and all of that. So. I'm going to zoom in talking about like what's the cost of not having a diverse and inclusive um, you know work environment, right? Like what makes diversity and inclusion crucial to a healthy, you know, productive and innovative workplace? And you know, on the flip side, like what are the detrimental costs if you don't think about that? And um, I I want to pose that question to both of you. Hey, I think I'm up first this time. I want to start by saying ideal is the right thing to do, period. There should be nothing else, but we know there has to be, so I'll continue. <laughs> but I'm going to say it one more time. Ideal, we should do it because it's the right thing to do. I think that so many times we don't consider that making space for the least of us helps us all rise to the top. We're all better at that point. When we celebrate differences, when we acknowledge that people come from different places and spaces and their wisdom and knowledge can help us do what we do better, we are better. There are studies that show companies that are that believe in ideal, DEI or whatever it is that they may call it and they practice it they thrive. I'm going to give a, a great example, Center for Excellence in Nonprofits. When I first joined there, it was, uh, I was the first Black person that they'd ever hired. 95% of the people they served were middle-aged white women. The board was completely male-dominated and all white. Um, and they hired me. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> And I think starting that journey, I would talk about ideal principles kind of through the back door. Once we realized that people were interested in wanting to hear it, we became more bold. And what it meant for CEN is that we tripled our budget size in three years. And now that organization is serving 50% of the global majority rather than one segment of the population. 
And I don't think this is a special result for a nonprofit or, or a small business. I think it can be representative of all businesses. Uh, I also, I was on a panel a, week, a couple of days ago and what I learned is that in California, 30% of the money comes from, from fee-for-service options. When you have diversity of thought, you can expand that to be greater than the 30% and it makes your organization more sustainable. I hope I answered your question. Do you wanna follow up at all? You, you did and I do have a follow up in a moment but uh, I'm gonna let Lillian uh, chime in here. Okay, thanks. Um, I would echo Ely's, you know, just commitment to doing ideal because it's the right thing to do. Um, I, I hear in that, well, I, I feel personally a little conflicted about this business case for DEI already that we always hear, right? And the like cost of doing it. Um, and, and I think there is real, real cost there, right? The, um, and I think that that is in, for a lot of for-profit, um, organizations, corporations, that may be the reason that they eventually or hopefully are engaged in some of the ready and DEI work. I think um, in the affordable housing sector, um, the nonprofit affordable housing sector, which is where I've worked, um, it, it is critical for our for the business, for the work that we do, but it is also very mission aligned. Um, and and so it's really important that if we are going to live up to our mission, that we actually um, create workplaces that are workplaces and, and communities, right? The housing that we build that are um, diverse and inclusive. Um, I, I, I do think, though, that there are a couple of things right now in this particular time where there is real cost to not pushing our workplaces to be um, diverse and inclusive. It is a really hard labor market right now, right? We hear this across the board. It, um, it is true at every level. And so if, if you are not diverse and inclusive, you have already excluded out part of the potential labor force, like part of your potential staff, right? You've put yourself at this disadvantage by signaling that you're not interested in, in, in everyone who could come and contribute. So I think that that's a really um, something for people to pay attention to right now, given um, the, the labor market as it is, which is very dynamic. Um, and then I also think the thing that we risk, which is maybe a longer term impact, but is, is falling behind. When we have a um, when we don't have a level of diversity within our workforce, I think we lose creativity. We don't have different experiences, different ways of thinking, um, different capacities and skills. Then we don't have all of that um, diversity and vibrancy to, to draw on. So we don't have as much creativity. We don't have as much um, kind of dynamic exchange of ideas. Um, when we don't have diverse uh, staff, we we lose the ability to relate to our residents and our communities, and and if we do that, we're not serving them as well as we could. And so, I think for affordable housing in particular, th those are some of the um, uh, specific costs of of not not having diverse and inclusive workplaces. Um, I think being mission oriented and mission aligned, and really being true to that mission, is actually a um, uh, an advantage that affordable housing and nonprofits have, and we should really um, look at how we lift that up and how we are true to it. Um, and then, you know, as Illy was talking about um, making sure that the the least of us are included and lifted up, also, I, I was thinking about the um, Fannie Lou Hammer um, quote that none of us are free till all of us are free. And, and it strikes me that like, none of us are in a good workplace until all of us are in a good workplace. Um, so I think that there's there's just real benefit to being a diverse and inclusive workplace as well as cost to not. So. You know, it's interesting hearing both uh, you, both of you bringing up this, uh, you know, often the trickle down economics we know is disproven doesn't work. But then if we help those that 
the majority and we all rise up together. That's proven over and over time to be a successful strategy. Uh, this is our second DEI panel. This exact point was also uh, raised in our first DEI panel. I'm gonna say it once more, being ideal is the right thing to do. That said, we know, right, that not everyone Illy mentioned, people, we have to meet people where they're at, different organizations, different places. So I'm gonna press more on this, like, how do we, you know, how do we quantify diversity, equity, inclusion, or how do we measure success, right? Because uh, if we don't, if we can't measure it, how do we know we are moving in the right direction? And Ellie, I know you can, you know, in your capacity as a consultant, you've seen, I'm sure, across the spectrum. So I'm gonna turn that over to you first. So white supremacy culture teaches us that we have to be able to measure it. Let me just start there. What I will say that organizations that continue to drive the shifts forward are experiencing those benefits. Organizations that are doing it because it's for performative reasons, it backfires and it hurts the organizations. It hurts those that are historically excluded. It puts them in situations where harm is done to them at work. I can't say enough, we, each organization needs to figure out where they are and they need to choose a path, a consultant or a group that can help usher them through. If you're at the beginning of the journey and you're not ready to talk about rights supremacy culture, you should probably hire a consultant that's more in that lane to get you started. Start with a walk. I might not be the one that you would choose, but there are people out there that you would, right? And I have learned in my work that assessment of where organizations are, where they want to go, and who is a part of the decision-making and the change process determines who they should select and how they should do the work. Um, I think you quantify it, even though I don't like to, by seeing that people stay longer in their roles. They bring others to the company. They spend time and energy learning about one another, being there for one another. And it's a different shift. What I will tell you is I've never worked at a place like CEN before. I felt myself, I felt at home, I felt cared for, and I did those same things for everybody I worked with. And when you can do that as an organization for all people, the organization thrives. I might not have ex exactly answered your question the way you asked it, but that's what you get. <laughs> well, as we said, I mean, those embody all the concepts of uh, being ideal, right? Uh, creating that access, being truly liberated instead of just uh, talk. Um, do, and, and I'll give you guys a pass because this is a difficult question, right? Where do we fall? Where do you see organizations falling short? And if you have experience, like, you know, with, like within the affordable ecosystem as an outside observer, you know, being internally, however you want to um, frame the answer to that. Um, Lillian, I'm gonna put you on the hot seat. I might combine that with your, your previous question, Stephen, about, um, about you know, quantification and metrics and, and how do we know. Um, I think that um, it can be a really challenging um, ask for organizations to get to metrics, um, especially like, true data-driven metrics. Um, and I think that, um, and I, I know um, a number of housing organizations are working on this, not just on the sort of staff side, but also on um, the vendor side and contracts. And one, as, a, as an industry, we never got together and decided, you know, what metrics we were all gonna 
use. So we have different metrics. We work on different software systems and there are different levels of comfort internally in sharing information. Um, I actually think that that pushing for some of these metrics, for some of the data-driven quantification can play a really important role in um, spreading the DEI and ready work through different parts of the organization um, and creating some transparency. And I saw that um, Christopher W. kind of raised up this issue of, of losing folks and turnover and institutional knowledge. And, um, and some of the ways we can combat that is by embedding it into our systems and processes. And so if internally we get to a point where we are reporting on um, the diversity of our candidates, the diversity of our hires, how the diversity of our retention, how long people typically stay and who's coming and who's going. Um, I think that we create better transparency and, and potentially highlight for ourselves places where we might want to invest more and do some more work and understand you know, who, are, who our workplaces are or are not working for um, and, and who has a sense of belonging, which is kind of what I heard Illy talking about, right? Like how comfortable are we? How, how happy are we and um, and able to really contribute in our jobs? Um, so I do think that that those some of those measures and metrics can be really important and can they can also be some of our challenges um, internally and where not where we may be falling short sometimes because we're not all on the same page, right? Because there's a, a DEI group that's really pushing for that level of transparency, but maybe the folks who are controlling the data or manage the data aren't quite there yet. So it can be an opportunity to have that, that conversation and get more folks on board and, and working towards um, some of our goals. Um, sometimes we're just not collecting it and there's a technical <laughs> shortfall. Um, and those are also things that we need to, to work on to really to understand like why we want to collect this data and um, and that it's not I don't think there's any malintent right I think if we're going in with metrics with the intent of um, really understanding rather than blaming um, then that I think is really important and can be um, more comfortable for everyone to get to some of those those metrics. Thank you. Um, and I'm curious beyond organization matrix and overall understanding of looking at data and movements of workers um, that can inform us of where DEI is in, in an organization. And I wanna get a little bit more deeper into the implementation level with your experience, both of you. Um, I'm wondering if, if each of you can provide some really concrete and specific examples you guys have done in your work that really help successfully promote um, an inclusive workforce. And so maybe there's some best practices you can share for other organizations. And then that goes to both of you guys. Can we just start with Ellen? Oh, it's me. Okay. So I've kind of said this a little bit before, but I'm gonna go back and do it again. The organization has to have a clear understanding of who they are, what they want and where they're going. They also need to um, be willing to shift and change all aspects of what they're doing. If they're looking to bring in diverse candidates, I would say that the change, and I've said it before, needs to be throughout the organization at every level. I love the idea of ERG groups, if they are taught um, and shared, uh, and information is shared with them about how they should show up. I also know that it's an emotional lift leading an ERG group, so they should be paid. I'm gonna say that again too. ERG group leaders and participants should be paid because they're going above and beyond. And it's a tremendous emotional lift. Um, I think with the ERG groups, it's important that charters are created and they are given power to start some types of changes. 
And I don't, for each organization that might be different, but it needs to be spelled out on the front end so that we can see and track the changes that we've been talking about because they're decided on the front end. We also have to realize that there has to be time or space to move and maneuver. It's not a straight line. This work is not that way. Um, what I will say is that you're gonna run into challenges. And the challenges that I would note, the first is fear. Um, the second would be unwillingness to be vulnerable, unable to communicate. Buy-in can be a very difficult thing across the organization. And in doing this work, you have to realize that some people might not make it and you have to be willing to make those tough decisions. And everyone has to be open to learning and growing. I, I, the organizations that I've worked with as a consultant that are willing to do these things have been the ones that are most successful in starting that change. They also realize that it's been 400 years for us to get here and you're not gonna fix it in six months. Um, I love that Ailey talked about willingness to learn, willingness to grow, not going in a straight line, because for those of us in the affordable housing industry, that is our work. You have to, you know, you have, we are, there's different regs every year that we have to learn, right? There's um, new environmental issues to deal with that we have to kind of grow and see and, and nothing is a straight line. We know that about our, um, the real estate work and certainly um, those, uh, those of us who work on the, property and site side with our residents and, um, you know, whatever comes up in our buildings on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so, so I'm, I'm hoping that means that we're um, well positioned to engage in and, and hopefully be successful in this work. Um, that will take us some amount of, uh, quite a bit of time, right? Because it, it took us a long time to get here and we have to um, kind of start, start rowing in the other direction. I, um, I, I want to focus a little bit about how we bring folks into the affordable housing industry as a place where I've seen um, some real success that is not, these are not my ideas. I did not come up with them. You guys will recognize them. Um, but, you know, I do think there's a lot of opportunity out there uh, to, to leverage what our industry is doing, what our peers are doing. Um, I think about the CCRH internship and the Bay Hip internship, and there's one in Southern California that I don't know the acronym for, um, but those are those are programs within our industry that are supported, and your organizations could tap into. And the organizations that I've worked at um, have all benefited from those programs in terms of um, growing our our workforce, diversifying our workforce, just finding really wonderful associate project managers and project managers to, to work with. Um, so I, I think that's a big success in our industry that, that we should li lift up and participating in it is the best practice for, um, for the developers out there. Um, I, I think that Illy mentioned before, like rewriting job descriptions to be more inclusive. Um, that work happened while I was at mid Penn and I, I, it wasn't work that I, I was doing directly, but was incredibly proud of the folks who were doing that work. And I think we saw an increase in candidates and interest in our positions. Um, so I think that's a, a real success of just trying to take down some of the barriers for people even considering um, coming into our industry and, and, and how we do that. Um, and then to build on, on Illy's point of um, really trying to empower ready groups, ERG groups to make change and, um, and start to advance the, the workplace culture. I, I think that having um, 
an executive sponsor or some level of leadership participation, maybe not directly in the ERG group, but to have um, some of the kind of top decision makers in your organization on, on board and supportive of that work can be very helpful in terms of actually advancing um, that work. That doesn't mean it's the only way to, to do it. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, work happen kind of from the ground up. I think some of the best ideas about what needs to happen come that way, but to really um, have uh, folks who can make decisions, can allocate resources on board and supportive of, of some of the groups that, that can guide the work, I think has um, it is really important and can be really helpful. And so, so sometimes that means you have to kind of develop that relationship and figure out who's going to be your champion, who's going to be your executive sponsor, um, if there isn't one already within your organization. Um, if you're interested in that work, I think it, if you're interested in this work and there is someone in your organization that is already in that role, then I think uh, developing a relationship with them is also, I would also suggest that um, as a way to continue to forward this work and your own um, ability to, to move some of the work forward so that they also know who, who's interested and invested in the work in the organization. Thank you both. And I, I appreciate what you just said and I can echo in thinking of um, working with Bay Hip interns and that's also an excellent program and also having that relationship as well. Um, it's what a wonderful discussion to date. So I'm gonna turn this over to Steven to wrap up. Sure. I think, you know, just one final question. So, and both of you have already begun to do this with the references to uh, leveraging existing resources such as these internship programs, right? But um, any other additional resources or resources you want to uplift, re-emphasize, um, I will say from two, from, for two audience groups, right? One from those who are in leadership roles, uh, would you direct them to anything in particular? And then what about uh, those who are uh, experiencing microaggressions and having a tough time uh, you know, in a certain uh, work environment that is not very conducive to all the benefits that we talked about? Ellie, do you wanna um, start with that one? Yes, so I'm gonna drop many of these resources in the chat. Um, and I think the resources are gonna they, they can work with organizations that are just starting on their journey, as well as folks that are deep into the work. Um, I, CEN has an ideal program that talks about the individual, and then it talks about the organization. That's been a very successful two-day program uh, that you could go to. Compass Point has great resources uh, and, and classes that you could take. The Management Institute, Race Forward, there are tons of books that I'm gonna name a few, White Fragility. The other version done by a person of color is The Pink Elephant. So if you're ready for a little bit more than White Fragility, try The Pink Elephant. The Sum of Us by Heather McGee is a powerful story of inequity over generations. Um, and it talks about redlining uh, specifically in that book, how to be anti-racist if you're ready. Lead from the Outside by Stacey, Ing uh, Stacey Abrams. Those are all very good resources. And sometimes you might not be ready outside, but you're ready at home. You can start by learning um, things that you're not comfortable with by yourself. And then as you get more comfortable, you start to ask questions and you start to grow individually but you start to grow with those people that are around you. And hopefully some of those people are the ones at work. And as you lean in, people will notice and they will appreciate. Um, Ily, I hadn't thought about Lead from the Outside for a while and I, I love that book. And I think it's a, a really good resource for both of the um, groups of folks that you talked about, Stephen, folks who um, might be able to lead this work or maybe in a more senior position within their organization and folks who are, um, you know, driving the work from the ground or entering the work, entering the workforce. 
um, it, it's a really good one and, and an easy read. Um, I, I think in terms of the, mm, and, you know, I think the trainings that um, Illy mentioned are great. I've done the race forward ones. They're um, really fun, even, even remote. I think they work really well. Um, NPH does have some resources. They, they build a resource page specific to affordable housing. So um, folks might want to check that out. And then also, um, I learned this through NPH that uh, the CZI work, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, um, they have a mailing list that you can get on and then they offer trainings and uh, and they're really pretty, inter uh, like a wide array of trainings. And the tr I think they've done a good job of um, having diverse trainers who come from really different perspectives on some so, some pretty like core basic things. Like there's there's um, really interesting folks who are leading like financials 101 for nonprofits. And so it, it's this nice combination of um, community and kind of technical skills sometimes. And some of them are more about leading um, DEI work within your organization, but um, I will figure out <laughs> how to share that. I'm sorry, I don't have a, a link to drop right now, but. Um, those are those are trainings. They tend to be shorter, you know, a few hours that um, that folks might be interested in, um, and and are very relevant also to the the housing or organizations. Thank you both for that uh, for that resource, right? Of naming all these resources, and I just want to let audience members know that we have been recording this. Uh, uh, it's our practice uh, with our coho DEI panels that we will be sending a follow up email, so we will. Uh, compile all of these uh, list of this to make it uh, a, a reference document uh, for you. So with that, we are going to stop recording now uh, because we're going to invite our 